Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. And we have His words, and we're talking His words as we come through. As we've been studying the book of... Oh, how did that go off? Um, as, there we go. I got it up here. So as we've been studying the book of Matthew, we've been looking at it from the perspective of the Jews. Okay, that Mo, Matthew is a Jewish man who we're going to be introduced to in his own book in a few weeks. But Matthew is a Jewish man writing to a Jewish audience regarding a Jewish Messiah. And so to fully comprehend, to fully get the, the fullness of what, what's being spoken here, what's being done, you need to, to kind of come out of your American, you know, 21st century American culture and place yourself back as a Jew in that day, okay? And comprehend, and especially some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, is very exciting. So we've seen Matthew um, talking about Messiah, his lineage, remember, it was so important because in order for him to really be the Messiah, he had to be of the lineage of David, okay? So he presents that, he presents then his birth, and we, we look at the worship of the wise men and how they come, and that's huge because, again, the wise men were magi, they were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. Rather, the Jewish wise men, we would call the scribes, right? They rejected him. They knew exactly where he'd be born, but did they go worship him? No. But the Gentile wise men did, okay? And so you're going to see this, this playing out that's happening here, okay? And in today's, today's message. And so then we see the forerunner, John the Baptist, okay? John the, the Immerser, who comes, okay? And Jesus becomes baptized by John the Immerser, and John says, no, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, allow it to be so, because we need to fulfill all things that are written. Okay? Jesus, is, uh, before that, was, was tempted in the wilderness, right? Or from, from that, he goes in the wilderness, he's tempted for 40 days. He comes out from being his, his temptation in the wilderness, and he begins to proclaim his message. Now, we know elsewhere okay, that John is also being arrested at that time, and that's when Jesus begins his ministry, his his public ministry, and he sums up his entire message with one Greek word, okay, and one English word, and it's what? What's the English word? Repent. Repent. Metanoia is the Greek word. It means change the way you think. So it's not mine. It's, you know, it's not just what I said. It's what Jesus said. That's what I love about the word. I mean, Jesus came, and he called the people to change the way they think that's it it sums everything up i need not just the world but i need to continually change the way i think that's what romans 12 is all about that that i'm supposed to offer myself as a what a living sacrifice and not be conformed changed on the outward appearance to the world but rather to be transformed changed in my inward man through the renewing of my mind, that I might be able to prove, to show, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of Bob. No. Of who? Of God. That's the whole idea. So, I think like the world. I grew up in the world. I act like the world. But then Jesus comes to me. And what? Everything changes. Life changes. So, he who began the good work in me does what? continues to perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 of Philippians, then we see that it is he who works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure, right? So that's what Jesus then gets into with the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling everybody, change the way you think, because the kingdom of God is drawn hand, drawn, drawn near, is at hand, right? And then he tells uh, Peter, or Peter and Andrew and then James and John to follow me, and I will give you to them a promise. I will make you fishers of men. But then he begins to teach the multitudes, not just his disciples, but he begins to teach the multitudes what it means to change the way you think. How should you think with a kingdom mindset? And so we just spent a month, and, a month, month and a half going through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to go back through it again, okay? But he ends the, the comment there. Um, with the practical side of the standard of the kingdom in that Sermon on the Mount. And the people were amazed. They marveled. They were astonished. Because Jesus taught with authority. He didn't teach like the scribes. But rather he taught with authority. Remember we discussed this at the very end about this concept of authority. The authority of Jesus and, and, and then the extension of that authority to 
you and I. All authority has been given unto me, Jesus said. Therefore, what? You go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them the things that I've taught you. Not me. Him. Because the words Jesus said, remember we talked about this, that Jesus only said what he heard the Father speak. Jesus only taught the doctrines of the Father. So the Son came and talked about the, the teachings of the Father. Jesus says it's profitable for you, for me to go, because if I go, I'm going to send the Holy Comforter to you. And when he comes to you, he's going to lead you into all truth, and he's going to remind you of my teachings. So the Holy Spirit comes. He lives within me. I mean, what a blessing that is, huh? And his job is to remind me of the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus' job while he was on the earth was to give me the doctrine of the Father. And then he says... Therefore, I want you to go. As the Father sent me, so send I you. So what are you, in me, us, supposed to be doing? Going, just like Jesus. People ought to be astonished at you. Because you teach like you have what? Authority. The world's not going to like that. They didn't like Jesus. He was in the world. The world was made by him, but the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own... Received him not. In fact, they didn't just receive him. What did they do? They killed him. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men persecute you for my name's sake. Do you believe that? The world doesn't like absolute truth. That's how he taught. Jesus taught like he had what? Absolute truth. Why? Because he did. Now, that's easy to say because Jesus is who? God. <laughs> that's all. I'm not. I know, if I was a Mormon, I could become a god. But I'm not, okay? And, and, and I'm not God. But I can stand on the authority of his message. And as long as I'm teaching his word, I have the authoritative truth. When I begin to teach what I think, we're in a world of hurt. Don't follow me. Make sense? So we transition now into this authority phase because what we're going to begin to read now in the next two chapters over the next three messages, Lord willing, okay, is that we're going to be focusing then on the display of Jesus' authority because, hopefully you can kind of see that. I'll take this off, light off here. You can kind of see it for just a real quick moment. It's a what? It's that picture that you never want to see in your rearview mirror when you're riding on the interstate, right? I know he's already there next to him. Because you know what's going to happen when you see that car behind you um, that has the, the decorations going off on top, right? Why is that, why, why is that guy got those blue lights blinking on top of this car? Oh, I wish he'd get from behind me. He's really annoying me. Doesn't happen that way, right? You see, you're riding down the road, and you should never see this happen. You should never see this happen, right? But, you know, isn't it amazing that even if you're obeying the, lim the, the, the speed limit, you see that guy in the middle of the uh, median or kind of tucked away to the side, and instantly you have this what? <laughs> this guilty feeling, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Why does a, a little car with a piece of blue plastic on top of it have such an effect upon us? Because he represents an authority. But, he, you know, his authority is meaningless. Think about it. His authority is meaningless. If it's not packed by what? Or packed by? Backed by power. If it's not... Packed by the power. Anyways, if it's not backed by power, there has to be power. Dunamis, that's the Greek word, where we get our English word, dynamite. <laughs> if there's no <laughs> behind the authority, how many people listen to it? We live in a... One, okay, good. We, we, we live in a state of anarchy. Because people are going to do, like the book of Judges says, what is right in their own eyes. Does it make sense? So behind, and that's what starts to happening, even with the Israel. Because Israel had a king before they asked for a king. Who was their king? God. But they began to rebel against his what? Authority. They didn't really believe that God would what? Back it up. What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. We all know that. How many of us? Don't don't answer this one out. 
How many of us live in that? How many of us really believe that God will be that judge one day? Now, I know I'm not going to get before the, the white throne. And listen, this is, this, is a, this is an upbeat message, okay? But this is a little of a, a negative at this moment for us, right? But this is the reality, okay? One day, I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm not going to go before the white throne judgment. That's Revelation chapter 20. I don't have to fear my salvation. But I know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that when I put off this tent, I'm going to go and I'm going to account for everything I've done in the flesh. That's a fact. So is the world. If someone then has authority, real authority is going to be backed up by real power. That's what we're getting ready to see Jesus do. The authority of Jesus is going to become testified, witnessed to, by the power that he's about ready to display. This is exciting stuff to me. The first thing we do is we see his authority over diseases. His authority over diseases. He's just done teaching the multitude. He's coming down. He's coming, you know, moving forward. And immediately, okay, think like a Jew. You've got to think like a Jew. Who is he met by? Unclean! 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 What happens when a leper comes walking out? And he's supposed to be crying out, unclean, unclean, unclean. What does every good Jew do? <laughs> Scatter. <laughs> Start stoning him. Because where is he supposed to be? He's supposed to be outside the city. Nowhere near them. He's supposed to be staying away from the multitudes. Lest he would affect them. Understand the beauty of it, actually. Okay, It was to protect society. Okay, So if someone truly was a leper, the, the idea was so that leprosy didn't spread. We understand that I'm not talking about sin right now. We're going to talk about that next week. Okay, um, But sin is always a part of this, isn't it? We understand that scripturally, leprosy is also seen as a, as a picture of sin. Okay, so But this guy is not just a spiritual leper. This guy is a what? He's a physical leper. He's really a leper. He's got skin disease. Now, whether it's leprosy or whether it's some other skin disease, I don't know. And the Bible has this kind of this thing that covers a lot of it. I know that this guy had an infectious skin disease. How's that? Something that everybody wants to what? Avoid. Hi, I'm Bob. I have AIDS. <laughs> exactly. I mean, whoa, don't spit on me. You know, I don't want to share what? Body fluids with you. Even though, don't think about that. That's our modern day leprosy, isn't it? Okay? And so someone says that you got, they got AIDS, HIV, whatever, they're HIV positive, however you want to say it, you want to say, Whoop! you should be biblically in another place. <laughs> you know? Okay? But when Jesus comes, again, everything what? Everything changes. This is exciting stuff. This guy comes and crying out. Instead of crying out, unclean, unclean, he comes up to Jesus and he says to Jesus, this is a very profound statement. Look at how much this guy knows. He wasn't there under all the teaching. You get it? He's exiled. Where is he getting the, the information? Somebody is passing him information about Jesus. This is kind of cool stuff. And he comes up to Jesus and he makes a very profound statement. If, if, if such a big word, isn't it? If you are willing. He didn't, he didn't come to him with a whole lot of faith, did he? He came to him in truth. If it is your will. If you are willing. Second part. You got the power. You have the dunamis. I know it says in our English you can. You have the power. If you are willing, if it is your will, I know you have the power. You have the dynamite. You got the dunamis to make me clean. Jewish word. Kick in on that. That's everything to them. An unclean person couldn't go in the temple. An unclean person couldn't go in the presence of God. An unclean person couldn't be in the presence of anybody. Jesus, I'm asking you to change my life. Everything about me. I want a healing. I want something that's going to enable me to have this relationship with God. Do you get it? This is huge. What a profound thing. If you are what? If you're willing. This is a big statement. 
Because name and claim it. We always talk about it, right? If you don't what? If you don't believe, right? You've got to believe. Well, let's look at some, some verses about this, okay? His faith, if you're willing, okay? Let's get someone to take Matthew 21, verse 21, 20, okay? And I got the slides, Liam, okay? I got the slides. Matthew 21. All right, Steve, somebody take John 14, 13 and 14. Okay, David, somebody take John 15, verse 7. Come on, I got a lot of verses. Gail, all right, somebody take James 1, 5 to 8. All right, and Debbie in the back. Gerard, James 4, verse 3, and then I saw a hand over this way. Phyllis, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 9. Okay? So this is all going to be dealing with us praying, okay, in faith and all this kind of stuff. So let's see what the Word of God says, okay? So Steve, Matthew 21, 21 and 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what you will not only do what is, was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So he starts off with, if you ask what? In faith, and he ends with believing. believing. If you ask, believing. Okay. So if you ask in faith, what do, what happened to the fig tree will happen for you. You can say this mountain be moved and cast into the sea; it'll be done as long as you what believe. Okay. John fourteen thirteen and fourteen. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus gave us the promise, right? You ask anything in my name, I'll what? I'll do it. So make sure you say at the end of your prayer, you'll always say what? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Because that's the hocus pocus. That's the kind of the, uh, the abracadabra. That's the, the, that's the, the moment where we kind of kind of rub the, the magic lamp and, and the genie's got to do what we ask. Okay? Gil, I think you have the next one. John 15. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done. Oh, man. Now we're starting to get caveats. Say that again. So we still have to ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. But now we got this caveat. If you abide in my word, and my word abides in you. Huh. All right. What does that mean? James 1, 5 to 8. Debbie. Uh, now, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But he shall ask in faith without doubting. For the doubt is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So I got still got, I got back to this thing about when I ask, I need to ask in faith. I need to believe. I, I can't be double-minded because then I'm just like this guy tossed in the sea, right? And so I'm not going to get anything. But there's a statement in there right off the very beginning, Debbie, that kind of was a caveat. If anybody what? Lacks wisdom. So now we're talking about what we're supposed to be what? Asking for. It didn't say if anybody lacked a pink Cadillac, right? Okay. All right, James 4, verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. You ask and you do not receive, which means that sometimes people ask and what? They don't get it. Why is it that they don't get it, Gerard? Asking selfishly. They're asking selfishly. And let's close it out with, we can do so many here, but i got one more verse to share. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Phyllis? Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I, I am strong. Amen. So the context there, Paul, Paul had an infirmity in his flesh. And what is, what is Paul, I mean, if there's a, a spiritual guy, right, who, who would kind of fit in this point of view, probably gets all of his prayers answered, right? I would think that's Paul, right? So Paul has this physical infirmity, and we're told what? He pleads three 
He pleaded with the Lord three times. I would call that prayer. I would call that earnest prayer. I would call that really diligent prayer, zealous prayer. And God said what? No. God said no. Deal with it, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, I'm going to be made strong. Looking at the book of James, which one of those verses did he fit more into? James chapter 4. Because he was asking according to his what? His flesh. It wasn't a matter whether God wanted him to have it, but when God said no to him, what did he do? He accepted it. 1 John 5, 14 and 14 sums it all up for me in this. Now this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to his will. He hears us, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Go on, finish it out. Delight yourself in the Lord, and you will receive the desires of your heart. But the caveat, we don't want to know the caveat, we just want to know that we're going to get the desires of our heart. You get the desires of your heart when you're delighting yourself in the Lord. So this guy's theology, this is amazing. I don't know who this this leper was, but this guy was a king in theology. He knew that Jesus had to be God in the flesh. He knew that he could do whatever he wanted to do. He could heal him, just like that. Boom! It could happen. But he knew that he couldn't just demand it. That everything was according to what? God's will. If you are willing... No way. It couldn't be God's will for him not to be healed. Talk to Paul about that. Who had his infirmity of the flesh. And God said, no. No, this is, this is bigger than you. Jesus had every right to say what? To say no. But this is in this part of Matthew for, for this moment. For us to see that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And so in that very moment, Jesus says to him, I'm willing. It is my will. I didn't talk about the word thalema in that last one, but it's the, the, the word for it to be your will, okay? And so, and so now he says to him, he says, if you are willing, it was a subjunctive, okay? I don't know if it's going to be or not. It's a subjunctive. It's a mood of unreality. But Jesus comes back and states it in the indicative. It's a statement of fact. I am willing. I am willing. Then what does he do? He doesn't talk to him. He doesn't say, you're healed, go away. What's the next thing he does? He touches him. He touches him. You're a Jewish guy, or girl, and you're kind of hanging out way out because there's a leper, right? And you just want to see what's going to happen. What's Jesus going to do? Could you imagine... Watching Jesus reach out and touch him. Some of you, because I'm just making you the Jewish crowd, right? Are thinking what? The guy's nuts. The guy's nuts. He broke the law. He broke, he what? Yeah, he broke the law. That's exactly right. This guy said he came to fulfill the law. He's breaking the law. But what happens every time Jesus touches something unclean? It becomes clean. How cool is this? The Muslims believe this so much. The Muslims, you know what the Muslims have done to the Eastern Gate? They've concreted it. They put concrete blocks in it. Chuck, you were just there in May. Where's Chuck at? Did they leave? Oh, in the back. You were just there in May, right? Oh, really? Was life goes fly, doesn't it? Woo. Anyways, I'm getting old, man. The days blur together. So you're the closest, I think, the last one. You're, oh, that's right. You were just in Israel in April. There we go. Is it still blocked up? It's still blocked up. The, the Muslims have concreted the eastern gate so that Messiah can't get through those eastern gates. And just to make sure that he can't get through, they put a cemetery right in front of it. Because a proper Jewish man couldn't go through that cemetery. Because he would be what? Unclean. Unclean. And so even if he could get through the gates, when getting through the gates, he'd be unclean. But do you know what's going to happen when he goes into the cemetery? There's going to be a resurrection. How cool is this? And you can see Mork from Ork. I don't know. Jesus is Mork from Ork. But, and the doors just go. 
And he just kind of walks right in. How cool is this? This is my God. My God reigns. Yeah? How cool is this? That's why I said this is an upbeat message. It really is. We're going to end with upbeat songs, man. We're going to end with some Jewish songs. This is kind of fun stuff. Okay? So you're going to have some downers. There's some stepping on the toes. But this is God's word, right? It kind of all goes together. He touched him. And then he what? This is huge. He commanded this leper to go offer the sacrifices, the offerings, to give the offerings that Moses had commanded. To what? To fulfill the law. But look at what he says. As a testimony to them, not to the priest. That was singular. He's supposed to give the offering to the priest. That's singular. But it was supposed to be a testimony to them. That's plural. Who's the them? It's you guys. Standing out there looking. Well, I'm touching this leper, thinking to yourself, what? Oh, I want you to be a testimony to these people who are doubting that I have the power over this thing. I want you to come back so that everything is what? It's being done according to the law, and I have the power. we got to fly. The centurion servant. This is kind of exciting. In some of your versions, it says that he had a palsy. But the word literally in the Greek is the word paralytica, paralyticos. Okay, which is where we get our word paralyzed. Kind of makes sense. The paralytic. Okay, the centurion servant was paralyzed. I don't know from what, what was causing it. I don't know. But what's interesting here between this week and next week? So I want you to put some of this in your brain. I know you guys are going to Sylvania. You're not going to be here, but that's okay. So the rest of you come next week. Okay, and keep this in your brain. Okay, because this is going to come into come into play. This is fun stuff. I got to teach down, and I'm not going to get into this as a rabbit trail, but I got to teach down at the, um, the VA, at the um, um, mental health group, many years ago on scripture and mental health. And I got to teach them scripture the entire day, eight hours to be able to teach these guys. And this is huge because what we're going to see Christ deal here, he's going to be dealing with things in the physical realm, and he's going to be dealing with things in the spiritual realm. Next week, we're going to be looking at the spiritual realm. Today, we're looking at the physical realm. This guy's paralyzed. He is paralyzed from physical reasons. Very important here. Okay? Now, the first thing we see is the faith of the servant, or the faith of the, the, the centurion. The centurion comes to Jesus. Okay? Now, I know in this version it says the centurion comes, and elsewhere it says that he sends his servant. I, I'm not going to be the guy that tries to define that for you. Some some say that, well, it's kind of like he sent the servant and he's he's present in the, in the message of the servant. I'm not worrying about that, okay? You, we can talk about that later, but that's a distraction, okay? The sortorian comes, whether it's through the voice of a servant or whether it's himself speaking this, he says something marvelous. Again, like that leper, he says something extremely marvelous to Jesus. He says, I am not worthy for you to come into my house. All I need you to do is what? Speak the word. You just say the word. And it's done. I too, and he uses himself as the illustration, I too am a man under authority. I say to this guy, go, and what? He goes. Back to the, the authority and the power. If I say to the private, go, and he doesn't go, what's going to happen? Yeah, literally, in a Roman army, he's off with his head. Now, in ours, he, the, the, the private may put up the yellow card and say, I'm nervous. Okay, whatever. Uh, okay. <laughs> but back in the day, when there was a real army. Anyways, nothing personal. You guys are in now. Okay, so there was discipline that went with it. Yes? Rodney, can you imagine that when you went through basic? Tell, tell him the, D, the, the DI, no, I don't think so. He would help you to think so, wouldn't he? He would be helping you to change the way you think, I think. In a heartbeat. That's exactly right, okay? So this Roman centurion, he gets it. I say to this guy, go, and what? He goes. I say, come. And they say, well, I'll be there after I finish my snicker bar. It doesn't happen that way, does it? It happens. He says, so I know. I know. If you just say the word, I am. My servant's going to be healed. Jesus marvels. He says to the, 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 to the centurion, he says, as you have believed, so it's done for you. This gets back to this will and believing thing. But the centurion what? He believed. And it, clearly it was what? The will of Jesus for this to happen. Jesus then 
has this exclamation. I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. And then he makes this statement. I don't have time to really unpack this thing. But this is marvelous. For you and I, we're Gentiles. This is huge. Many will come from the east and the west. That's us. And sit with, down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. Again, you're a Jewish man. <laughs> listening to the guy who's proclaiming to be a Jewish Messiah. And he's just telling you what? The Gentiles are coming in, but you, you're out. This is how to make friends and influence people. This is called speaking the truth. Was it going to, you think it was going to be a popular message? No. But it was a truthful message. People need to hear where they're going to go if they don't believe. That's the truth. And that's love. That's speaking the truth in love. Look, I don't want my family to be in the bad place. The H-E double hockey sticks. There was a good news club. That's what we've got to do. We've got to talk about the bad place. You know, every time I say the word hell, they're <gasps> you're swearing. <laughs> it's a place. It's a place. And it's a real place. And it's an eternal place. People who go there will live forever. They'll live forever. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a bad thing. It's not a popular message, is it? But Jesus didn't hold it back. Do you know why? Because he loved them. He loved them. Might have been a little shock treatment here. Then we have the mother-in-law of Peter. We're kind of flying through these things, okay? Jesus, after all this, he goes to Peter's house. They're going to have a little downtime. Ha! They're going to have a little downtime. They walk into the house, and note the first thing is this expression of compassion. When Jesus had come into the house, he what? He saw. I am so guilty of this. Heather, I'm going to pick on you. First day here, I'm going to pick on it. When did I first see you? I had already been teaching five minutes, and I looked back and I saw, oh, hey, Heather, are you at? Anyways, how bad is that? I was discombobulated, and you put Bob right in the middle of that, because it's always that happens to me, right? I think I'm, I'm the cause of that word, okay? I was discombobulated with the things that were going on, and I was just coming up and just in a shambles, you know, trying to get the, everything going on, and, and I mean, and so I begin teaching, and I'm praying, and I'm moving on, and then I'm finally looking at people. Do you get it? I am so stinking self-centered in, in tunnel vision sometimes, okay? I mean, it's just honest. But I can say this honestly because I know there's no temptation, no troublesome situations overtaking me, but such as what? Common to men. And women, I'm saying, yeah, it's not to us, it's just to the men. <laughs> Anyways, but I know we're all sinners. You guys are all stinking selfish, just like I am. Some, may, some of us may be more selfish than the others, but we're all what? Self-centered at some point. Jesus walked in and he saw Peter's mother-in-law. He saw she wasn't feeling good. She was on fire. Literally, that's the Greek. She was on fire. She had a fever. Was it infection, Dr. Steve? Usually when someone has a fever, they probably have an infection, right? Okay, good. I, I didn't want to make that claim on my own. So I, I put the question mark so I could ask you, Steve, just to confirm that. Probably the case. If she's on fire, she's got an infection someplace. She's got an, another infectious disease. Jesus says, take a couple of Tylenol, call me in the morning. He doesn't do that. Look what he does here again. He saw his wife's mother lying sick. So, so, what did he do? He touched her. Isn't that amazing? He had eyes that he saw the needs of people. And when he saw the need, he what? He got involved. He touched her. I don't think he went slapping her in the forehead and said, Be healed! I think he just touched her. He said, daughter, be healed. It was a fulfillment, then a prophecy as well. We're told in Isaiah 53, which we know is all about the Messiah, it says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and literally that's sorrow from affliction, and acquainted with grief, literally that's infirmity and sickness. So he's a man of sorrow, okay, and he's acquainted with infirmities and sickness. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our grief. That's really our infirmities and sickness. 
and carried our sorrows. You can check me out on this, please, with your blue letter Bibles or with your e-swords. You can go and you can find the, the Hebrew words that are behind that and you can do a, a search on every time that Hebrew word is used and you're going to find that I'm, I'm not lying to you here. Okay? That word grief really isn't grief. It's, it's infirmities. It's sickness. That's how it's used. Everywhere else in the Old Testament, that's how it's used. Surely he has borne our infirmities and our sicknesses and carried our sorrows, sorrow from affliction. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our trespasses, our transgressions, our rebellion. He was bruised for our iniquities, our evil and perversity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and it's by his stripes we are healed. Again, I don't have time to unpack all that. But the reality is behind a lot of our sicknesses, I'm not Job's friends. Behind a lot of our sicknesses really is sin. We'll see that more next week. Come back next week. Okay? But behind it, a lot of it is sin. Now, boil it all down. Forget the, the, the specific sins. Behind it all is what? The original sin. Did God, when God created Adam and Eve and put him in the garden, do you think he put him in the garden to have cancer? Do you think he put him in the garden to be paralyzed? Do you get what I'm saying? What brought those things in? Sin. So, he bears our, our griefs, our infirmities, right? But in the end, we're told he was wounded for what? Our sins. Our evil, our perversity. Our iniquities. That's why he died. And then, giving victory over that, we have an extension that applies then into the physical realm with our physical infirmities. Okay? Next week, you see on the, in, your, in your bulletins the verses that we're going to start looking at, memory verses for, next, for November, from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for everything. I didn't say that. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Tranquility and thanksgiving go hand in hand. We'll unpack that as we go. But suffice to say for right now, Jesus, in doing these things, we're told, was fulfilling scripture. That's something that we have to struggle with here, when we look at, think of our theology. Okay? But we have this next part, and i got to go real quick through this. There's authority over nature. Okay, Again, just an amazing thing going on here. We have these fishermen who've been on, on the, the Sea of Galilee all their lives. Right? And they're going to go out on this boat, and something amazing is going to happen. But before that even happens, they have a dilemma. These people who are with Jesus in Capernaum, as he's getting on the boat, they got a dilemma. Because Jesus, in a heartbeat, makes the decision. He's no longer going to be hanging out in Capernaum, where all these people were from. He now wants to go where? To the other side. He's going to go to the other side of the lake. They've got to make a decision. Jesus said to them what? What was the command? Way back, what was his command to them? After he said repent, he told them to do what? Follow me, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, that's easy when he's hanging out in Capernaum. But now all of a sudden he's what? He's fixing to leave. We already know Peter has a what? A wife, because he had a what? Mother-in-law. That kind of goes with the territory, right? Which means he might even have what? Children. He might even have kids. Now, we're not told who are the ones that are asking him questions. We're just told some of the ones who are following him. Some of his disciples, it uses the word, come up and they ask him this question. Lord... Can, 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 you, can you just wait a moment? Let me go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. Jesus basically answers their questions and says what? You have to make the decision. What's your decision? You're going to follow me or you're not going to follow me. Following me is going to require you to come to a crisis of faith. Are you willing to leave everything to follow me. We have it easy in the United States. We don't have to make that decision. 
If God gave you a revelation, now I understand it's going to be consistent with the word of God. I get that. But, but put yourself in a scenario. I mean, I know you hate these scenarios, but think about it. Would you be willing, if God told you that all of a sudden, and I don't believe this at all, don't quote me on this one, all of a sudden you believe that the Jehovah Witnesses were right. Whew, no way. Ah. Anyways, but you saw it in God's word, and you shared it with your friends and with your family, and they all told you that you were a heretic. Would you follow what you knew to be true? Or would you be influenced by everybody else? Now, take it the other way. Brian, like your testimony, right? You, how, the, you get the two sons. The one says, no, I'm not going to go, but then he eventually what? He goes. The other one says, oh, yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, Father, I'll go. And he doesn't do anything, right? You have a choice to make. Are you going to go? Are you going to follow are you going to follow Jesus? This is these disciples. They have this dilemma. He gave them a command to go to the other side. If you want to follow, you're going to have to leave everything. Well, those who made the decision to go with him, they what? They follow them. And they go on the boat. And while they go on the boat, instantly they find out we made the wrong decision. They didn't. But could you imagine what's going on in the brain? When all of a sudden this huge tempest comes up and they think they're going to what? They think they're going to die. But I love this. The plea of faith. Lord, save us. Not even a matter of what. If it's your will. <laughs> I don't have a moment to, to, to be thinking about pondering the theological implications of this moment. We're dying. <laughs> What's that, David? Help! Help! <laughs> yeah, we're dying. Lord, save us. Jesus responds with what? You have little faith. What? They came to him. Why would Jesus respond to you of little faith? I, I, I know I'm past time, but think this one through. Why do you think Jesus says you're of little faith? He's right there with him. Say again? He's right there with him. He's right there with him. Yeah, exactly right. If you knew who he was, do you think he's going to die? Did you just not see what happened to the leper? Did you just not see what happened to the... Do you, what, are you, what are you so worried about? Well, that's infectious diseases. This is a what? A storm at sea. <laughs> this is different. This is different. He arose and he rebuked. He rebuked. Can you, can you get it? You go outside in the middle of the hurricane and, and rebuke it. Yeah, right. He rebuked it. Literally, the word is a negative command. He can do that. Why? Because he has the dunamis to go with his authority, with his exousia. Rebuked the winds and the sea, they what? There was a great calm. Mark says that he stood up and he said, Peace, be still. That's what he can do in your life. That's what he can do in my life. It's just not the storms that are on the lake. It's the storms in life. He can be in the midst of that storm and Jesus all of a sudden steps out because you say what? Okay, this is your storm, Jesus. I didn't know how to run a business. But I said, God, this is your business. And I always had enough work. God always took care of me. I never advertised. But I always had enough work. In fact, I didn't even start the business. He did. He's always in the midst of the what? He's always in the midst of the storm. Always in the midst of the storm. If you know him. The question is, in the midst of the storm, do you pull out the oars and try to do it yourself? We'll find out in a few weeks that there's another opportunity they have in the middle of the storm, and they, what? They pull out the oars and do the same thing again. But finally they say, they cry out, save us. And Jesus does what? He saves them. So in the end, what do you believe about Jesus? Who is he to you? Is he really God? I mean, do you just say that in your mind? Or do you really believe it? Does he have the power to do things? Do you believe he's still, still able to cure the incurable? He is. Again, it's according to what? His will. And we understand that he didn't cure Lazarus. He didn't cure Peter. He didn't cure Paul. These guys all what? 
died at some point. Make sense? So not always preventing people from that is his will. He's got other purposes. But is he able? Yes. Do you believe that he's able to calm the storm, both physically and emotionally, in your life? When you cry out to Jesus, are you concerned with his will, or are you just concerned about your own? A lot of times we have a little bit more time than the guys in the boat, don't we? Do I really care? Jesus was in the midst of a huge storm. Huge storm. He's getting ready to die. And he's praying, Father, let this cup be removed from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but what? Yours be done. What did the Father say to the Son? No. No, I'm not taking the cup from you. It's yours to drink. This has been the plan from the beginning. If you don't drink this cup, it's all over with. But this is the purpose. You're drinking the cup. And you're glad he did. You're glad that the father didn't get soft in the moment in the garden and change the plan with the son. Do you get what I'm saying? There's a time when the father has a bigger purpose and a bigger plan than what we see. We need to start looking at the perspective of God. Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? We're going to close with 700... Um, 14, 715, 716, or 715, 716, 717, is the Jewish set. Um, he is Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. I am the God that healeth thee. And we're gonna we're gonna close with a celebratory um, song set. So if you want to stand with me on this, and then um, we'll close in prayer after that. Mm-hmm.